Right. And on that on that note of commencement, we shall commence. Um, it's seven o'clock. This is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is the Akshaya Mati uh, Bodhisattva Sutra, Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Mind Sutra. We are about to conclude the beginning of the sutra. We're about to conclude the beginning. And by, of course, you're, if you're here at part 12, I think this is part 12. If you're here, you know what's going on. We are at the, I, I've run out, I've run out of room here. We're at the end, the 10th paramita tonight. Nyana, knowledge. I, I wish I had like an echo effect on my microphone. Uh, nyana, 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 nyana. Because this is really, um, this is something uh, tonight. So this, of course, is our 10th, our 10th paramita. And we are going to be going through 10 dharmas or 10 observations or practices, 10 dharmas that are foremost in the practice of knowledge, we are definitely going to take a moment <laughs> before we dive into this list, we are gonna take a nice long moment to discuss this idea, jnana, knowledge. Way, way before we can get into all of this, we need to get a firm ground of what we're talking about tonight. And, you know, this has to do with these, these last four, again, I'm running out of room here, but these last four paramitas, the paramita of skillful means or upaya, bala, power, pranidana, devotion, and now Nyana, these last four paramitas are, you know, I spent a whole night sort of just getting us ready for these last four. Um, they're unique. You often in a way don't hear so much about these four. That, that may be for a reason, but nonetheless, this is going to be probably one of the first sort of Dharma talks that I've given about this paramita. It's come up, it's come up here and there, you know, but I've definitely done Dharma talks about pranidana or devotion. I've done Dharma talks about the powers, the superpower powers or bala, upaya. I'm, I'm always doing Dharma talks about upaya. That's just like always happening. But this one, this last one of knowledge. Yeah, I've kind of in a way been saving up for this, I got a lot of a lot to share just regarding this one idea. Um, it's a very curious idea. I've had a lot of um, insights. I'd call them insights. I've had a, lot, a few insights uh, yesterday and today when I'm trying to really figure this out. In particular, as I've been trying to figure out how to best present this list of ten dharmas that are associated with this uh, paramita of jnana. But again, let's start with just this idea of this paramita. So the, the word, the Sanskrit word that we're dealing with today is jnana. And this, of course, is a very interesting word because it's the root word of a lot of Buddhist ideas that we talk about. We talk about pranya. In fact, pranya is one of our paramitas. And the root of that word pranya is, it's basically like pranyana. It's pra knowledge. And there's a different ways to interpret pranya. Wisdom is the traditional one. Some people like uh, intuition or instinct in a way for pranya. And that has to do with this pra knowledge. So a pre-knowledge. That idea of sort of foreknowledge is kind of built into this idea of pranya. We also talk about samnya, per, what is usually translated as perception, but that's also a type of jnana. But samnyana is a 
a knowledge that is gained by gathering things together kind of into uh, conce conceptual frameworks, you could say. So a samnya. Uh, again, we have pranya. We have vijnana, vijnana, consciousness in Buddhism. Uh, vijnana, of course, is a type of jnana, but it's a v, uh, vi in English, that sort of prefix, that Sanskrit prefix vijnana, which means split divided, separated, vijnana, so sort of um, divided knowledge. So there's all of these different types of jnana, samnya, vinya, pranya. But today it's just jnana, no, pre no prefix, no prefix, <laughs> just the root, the, the root idea. And so, you know, in, in many Dharma talks in the past, I kind of do the etymology, the, the, basically the English word know, to know something, and the English word knowledge, knowledge, comes from this Sanskrit word jnana. The Greek word gnosis, if you're familiar with gnosis and Gnosticism and the idea of knowing in the Greek tradition, it's gnosis, but even the Greeks get that word from the Sanskrit jnana. And then if you go really, really, really deep with this jnana, you will learn that where you place your tongue in order to correctly make the sound jnana, they call it a cerebral, not a palatal. Palatals are where your tongue is at your palate, which is kind of at the front top of your mouth. The cerebral is right below your cerebrum. That's why they call it a cerebral. And so the idea is you are actually, when you say the word jnana, and even the Greek gnosis, and even eventually the English knowledge, you are placing your tongue at the top back of your mouth and pointing at your cerebrum. You're pointing at the knowledge base with your tongue. At least that is what the more kind of esoteric Sanskritists would, would tell you, is that the actual, actual word jnana is, get ready, poetic for the act of knowing. So knowing actually sounds like is, is where we would go with this. If we, if we were having fun etymologically and linguistically. I do, I say that and I do that though be, to give you a feeling that tonight there, it's like, this is serious. This is knowledge, knowing, you know, and I, and, and, you know, I, I have a lot of notes that are, I've already torn those no notes up by the way, but like, I have a lot of notes, you know, about uh, the Gnosticism and like the Western European traditions and this, it's a whole like um, uh, sub religion. So a sub-religion of all these religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, all of these religions have a kind of sub, a sub-layer in which they are really interested in you having direct understanding or direct knowledge of something. And so there's this kind of just this current within religion of gaining knowledge. So that's interesting. <laughs> but tonight we're speaking specifically about jnana as it pertains to the bodhisattva path. And of course, we've been talking about the bodhisattva path for 12 weeks now, right? We've been talking about it for the entirety of this sutra because it's what the bodhisattva Akshayamati has asked about. And I, because of where we're at, in this, the 10 paramitas, and we're about to go through the 10 practices of the 10th paramita, I need to remind you of something. And what 
I need to remind you of is that the bodhisattva, the, the seeker of enlightenment or the being of enlightenment, the bodhi, enlightenment sattva, being, the being of enlightenment, you got to keep in mind that sort of what, what the path, what the bodhisattva path leads to is Buddhahood, is like complete full, perfect enlightenment, anuttara samyak sambodhi. Um, and that's, a, that's important to point out that, you know, we, this is not a sutra for how to be a shravaka, a voice hearer, a follower, a liberated human being. This is a slightly different path where the bodhisattva is not just interested in their own liberation, they're actually interested in the liberation of all sentient beings, which is what makes a Buddha or the Buddha, a Buddha or the Buddha, is that concern for all sentient beings, not just their own liberation. That is what the story of Siddhartha is about. It's what the story of Buddhism is about, that the Buddha didn't just enlighten himself. The idea is, is that it created this sort of system or path for the liberation of all beings. And so that interest in the liberation of all beings, that's the bodhisattva path. And to, well, to go all the way to the end of that path results in Buddhahood. And that's kind of what we're talking about today with this 10th paramita, where we are talking about a kind of uh, crossing over point, a, a, a moment where the bodhisattva ce ceases to be a bodhisattva in a way and attains Buddhahood, or at least this is an outline of that concluding path of Buddhahood. And the reason why I wanted to remind you of that, that this is the bodhisattva path and bodhisattvas are headed towards Buddhahood, I wanted to remind you of that because well, it has to do with knowledge as it applies to Buddhism. The first thing that I think I would like to note about this is that there's a way of thinking about this type of knowing, this jnana, the jnana that we're talking about tonight. There's a way of thinking about it as like, well, I, I kind of, for tonight, I think just to, to set the tone, it's about thinking about knowing something, you know, like knowing it versus not knowing. You know, I'm not sure, I don't know, maybe, maybe not versus knowing. There's things that we know and then there may be things that we're not certain about, but then there's knowing. And what I want you to think about tonight is sort of a, you know, we usually know something, but what if you were to remove the something that you know and just look at the disposition of knowing? It's like a disposition of a kind of a certainty, assuredness, solid, like it's, you know, it's hard to describe actually when you remove the content of knowing, like what it is that you know, and you just try to examine knowing, just knowing, not knowing this or that or the other. I want you to kind of just th be thinking about that idea of uh, that this knowledge, this knowing, well, it might be helpful to think of it as not knowing anything in particular, but again, a certain disposition of knowing. So that's the sort of the first thing to discuss with jnana, this knowledge, what knowledge, like what knowledge? Okay, first of all, it's maybe not a knowing of anything in particular, although we're about to, to discuss 10 things that could be known in a certain sense. But let, let's just dive in. Let's, let's just dive into the list. These are the 10 dharmas that are considered foremost 
by the bodhisattva in the practice of jnana. And so the Buddha says, virtuous one, bodhisattvas practicing the paramita of jnana or knowledge regard 10 dharmas as foremost. One, the virtuous or skillful complete understanding of all dharmas. That's the basic idea. Now there's some, some sort of pref, you know, this, this adjectives, uh, skillful or virtuous, that, un, that is important within the world of Buddhism that they preface this sort of skillful or virtuousness. But for the sake of time, we can sort of put that on the side right now. You know, we're not, we're not disregarding it. We're just putting it on the side. And what we're looking at is that this first, this first one, it's about, and it has to do actually, it's the, a little tiny Chinese character right here. It's actually just a simple little squiggle of a line really. But interestingly, this uh, liu, liu zhi, so these, these two liu zhi, to completely know, to fully know, totally, completely, fully understand or know. And then it's all dharmas, all truths, all principles, all laws. But I want to discuss this idea of like, the first one of this list is a kind of a full or complete understanding. And what this is a reference to, in, in, uh, as far as I can tell, there's, there's something in Buddhism that doesn't get discussed enough as it should. It's being referenced here, which is surprising because this is like a Mahayana Sutra and we're like so kind of late in the game of Buddhism. But what's being referenced here in this very first Dharma is the very, 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 very first Sutra, the very first teaching that the Buddha gave this is called the Turning the Dharma Wheel Sutra, the Dharma Chakra Pavartana Sutra. This is where the Buddha to just five, they're not even monks. They're not even monks at that point. They're just five wandering ascetics. After becoming fully enlightened, the Buddha basically outlines the Four Noble Truths. That's kind of the, the heart or essence of the very first teaching of the Buddha is about suffering, uh, which, you know, we could translate as anxiety, stress, suffering, dukkha, right? So dukkha, what's causing our stress, anxiety, or suffering, which is clinging or attachment. The third noble truth, which is that if one doesn't cling, attach, or crave, one won't have anxiety, stress, and suffer in that way. And then the fourth noble truth is the path, the eightfold path that leads to the ability to release and therefore not suffer. It, incredible teaching. It, it's really all you need. It's really all you need. But there's an important part about that very, very first sutra in which the Buddha outlines the four noble truths. There's one really important part of it that I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of people just either don't mention or it just, it just doesn't get talked about. And what the Buddha says is that those four dharmas, suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering and the path leading to the cessation of suffering, that those four dharmas, he, at the end of the sutra, he outlines these it, 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 he calls them turnings. And what he says is that these are the three, these three turnings of these dharmas. And so even though it is typical to discuss the three turnings of the wheel of the law to dis, or the wheel of dharma, people usually refer to the three turnings of the wheel to refer to these three large movements in the history of Buddhism basically like early, early Theravada Buddhism, 
Mahayana Buddhism, Bodhisattvaness, and then Vajrayana Tantric Buddhism. And in order to make sense of how those three pretty different practices, in order to make sense of how they, may, they fit together, people speak about the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. The basic teachings, the more advanced teachings of emptiness, and then the really wild tantric teachings. But there was, before that rubric or before that even existed, that idea of three turnings of the wheel to describe all of these other teachings, there was the original idea of the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. And in that very first sutra, the Buddha talks about a, well, in very, very fancy philosophical speech, they speak about the indicative mode of the, the dharmas, the orative mode of the dharmas, and the some other mode. There are these fancy grammatical modes that are used to, what's the third one? The definitive mode or something. Anyways, in the language of the Buddha, he says that there are these four noble truths that the, it, 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 they exist, you should know about them. Or not you should know about them, but that you, it, they exist. The second turning, the second phase, or the second approach to the Four Noble Truths is that they should be understood. This is the, what is called orative. The, um, it has a sense of um, uh, that you should understand them that it would be in your best interest to understand these relationships, not just hear about them, that they exist in the universe, but you should consider them. And then the third turning, the third phase of approaching the Four Noble Truths is fully understanding the Four Noble Truths. So he says, there are these Four Noble Truths, these Four Noble Truths should be understood and these Four Noble Truths have been understood. And that's, it's kind of very interesting to think about that. Those three modes, those three modes, just the indicative, which is that there are these ideas. By, oh, by the way, did you know the Buddha said that our suffering is caused by this mental clinging attachment? Did you know that? That's the indicative mode. Did you know? <laughs> then there's this second mode, which is like, and you know what? It might be a good idea to, to think about that. It might be a good idea to, to consider that. One should understand those relationships. And then the third turning, and actually when the sutra ends, the Buddha says, and it was only when I had fully understood these four dharmas in these 12 ways, which are the four dharmas, the first way, the second way, and the third way. So that's 12 kind of dharmas in that sense. He says, only when I've understood them in those three ways, all four dharmas, could I claim to be a fully enlightened Buddha. It's my understanding that that's what's being referenced here. And the first one is about fully understanding dharmas in that third way. And that's knowledge to really, really know something. In my dharma practice, for example, I have definitely heard about the Four Noble Truths. I teach the Four Noble Truths a lot. So the indicative mode, I'm indicating the Four Noble Truths a lot. So indicative mode, check. We're good on, on the first turning of the Four Noble Truths. In my, I, I, and I know that they should be understood. That's basically where I'm at. Personally, me, Michael, is I'm in the mode of knowing that these Four Noble Truths should be understood. And I'm, I'm considering them all the time. I make no claims to have fully understood them because I make no claims to be a fully enlightened being, not by any stretch of the imagination. But that's actually what, it, for me personally, 
is is one of the things I love about Buddhism is, you know, the Buddha is famous or it's, it is said that the Buddhists, that the Buddha said that you should never believe anything is true because you read it, because you heard about it, or even because the Buddha said it was true, that you, that the only criteria for truth is your own experience of truth. That's it. There's no, and this is amazing actually for a religion or even a philosophy to say, yeah, authority, if some authority figure says it's true, that does not make it true. <laughs> if it's in print, that does not make it true. The only thing that makes something true is that you have had a direct experience of its truthfulness. And that's what, again, what this first one is referring to, a direct experience of the truthfulness of these things, a full understanding where it's like, wow, the Buddha was so right about the, those noble truths, fully understood, right? That would, that would be my summary of this first Dharma, that it is re-emphasizing this original Buddhist idea that we can hear about this stuff, we can consider this stuff important in that way that it should be understood, but that is different than actually understanding it. And that you are the only uh, judge of that full understanding in that way. So, okay. Questions, comments, ideas about any of that? Opening remarks? <laughs> I think what I found, hi, Michael. Hi. <clears throat> Um, what I think think is kind of interesting, you know, when we think about understanding, then then we link it to intellectual understanding, right? And um, which is which is very misleading. We talked about so much in the past about symbolism and you know the the example Krishnamurti gave. I think we talked about a couple of time uh, sessions ago, like. If a child sees a bird, he's like, if a child sees something in the sky, he experiences this thing in the sky and then maybe embodies it and looks at it. As soon as you say it's a bird, the, the child will never see this thing again. He will always see the bird. But if you would ask someone like, what is this? Then I would say it, it's a bird. And like everybody would be, yes, it's 100% a bird. It's not a pig. It's mm -hmm. not a horse, you know what I'm saying? So this understanding can be very misleading because we talk about oftentimes symbolism. So I think for me in that context about complete understanding, yeah, for me it's understanding in our language misleading um, because I don't understand also, I don't understand fundamental reality, like, <laughs> right? Like you can't even like with your mind, you can't understand fundamental reality in that sense, because yeah. So anyway, it's just a comment that I think understanding could be very misleading for us here in the Western world. I, I, I hear you, Connie, I agree. And what you just said is sort of um, um, the, um, that was what was behind my, uh, those comments I made at the beginning about thinking about knowledge, but without any content that's sort of along the lines of what you were getting at, or, or at least I'm trying to put those two together where this knowledge may not be, uh, have content in that way. And so it's interesting to look at what knowing means when it has no subject or no, nothing that is known, but there is still the disposition of knowledge. And I'm not saying I know what that is in that way. I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. Yeah, I feel like the only thing that we, you know, like in that context, and I've never heard about understanding without content. I think this is this is really interesting. It's very paradoxically. And I, I think about uh, Rupert Spira, um, the non-dual non teacher, who basically often, you know, says the only, like not says, but he's very much into experience. So the only th thing that you experience is that I am, or there is beingness. This is the only thing everybody can create on, a cre on. Um, I know he says, I am aware. This is his thing. You can call mm. it beingness or consciousness or, you know, Buddha's nature. And this is what I feel like when I, when we say I am aware 
and everybody you know stops and there's this moment of silence then there's a turning inwards without direction right without north south west or east so this is a knowing which is without content but this is actually only the knowing that i can think about without content everything else is for me with content so um yeah but, uh, understanding without content is amazing <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> okay, Michael, let's keep going. Unless there's any more questions or comments. I think I have a. I think I have a quick question. Yeah, um, no. You were talking earlier about this sub-religion, mm. uh, which is a a direct knowing. Or a, that's not. You didn't say direct knowing. I think, but you said like a, a knowledge that that all these religions want you to have. Is that does that overlap? Is that coincidental with the, with the contempl contemplation? Like, does, yeah. Is it? Does it? Does it? Are they the same thing, or are they? Or are they overlapping? Like religions in which there is, is it? Is it direct knowledge in all these cases, or not necessarily? And is it contemplative? Because I don't know how else you have direct knowledge of contemplation. Oh, um, wow. Okay, so so first of all, I have no doubt we're going to get through this list uh, tonight. And so the reason why I I dropped that initial little seed about this sub-religion of knowledge or gnosis or jnana is because there's going to be some interesting cross-cultural, cross-religion parallels going on as we go through this. So I kind of wanted to, to get that ready in a way. As far as that goes, though, known regarding contemplation and all of that, you know, I think, you know, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, it's so interesting. This really dovetails with Connie's question and in, in, or Connie's uh, comment in a way where it's like, yeah, when you're not dealing with a content-based knowledge, it's very tricky to, to speak cross-culturally. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm thinking in particular, for example, you know, if you've ever heard of Gnosticism, that is this sub-religion I'm talking about, although Gnosticism is usually considered specifically a sub-religion of Christianity, or at least a way of being Christian, which is a Gnostic form. And the Gnosis the knowledge in that tradition, the, the Gnostic Christian tradition, seems to be quite revelatory, religious experience base. One has these experiences and then knows something. And, you know, that reminds me, Noah, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this up uh, or asked that question because we have done over the course of this sutra, these paramitas and these 12 weeks, probably every Sunday, but definitely throughout the various Sundays, we have discussed this idea that more or less within Buddhism, but definitely within Mahayana Buddhism, this idea of an objective reality has been removed. <laughs> we understand that the very idea of an objective reality is a product of a subjective reality experience. And so as in the Mahayana tradition, there is this really interesting, deep, deep recognition of every individual sentient being's subjective experience being the absolute truth for that being's subjective experience. <laughs> and there is no other way for it to be. There is no objective reality for them to be wrong about. That, that idea, which again, we've probably talked about almost every Sunday night, which is that there's this kind of um, deep intersubjective experience going on, but that ultimately we are each in our own perception bubble realms our own conditioning, our own thought patterns, and all of that. Here's the thing though, if you really feel that, if you really understand what, what that 
means to take the idea of re objective reality and, and get rid of it, then that also means, how can I say this? It means that when someone knows something, they, they can know it. And even though it might not match up to your knowledge, it doesn't matter in this worldview because we're all in these deep intersubjective experiences. And so, yeah, that idea of like knowledge of like truth, reality. And if I could like, and, and if I knew that, then it would be like, I, it's like I would know it was really going on or whatever. And that's not what this is about because there's no objective reality to know. What there is, is fully, completely understanding why you're having the experience you're having. That's the real knowledge, the why, not a content. It's not a thing, it's a why. And then the why will look differently for everybody. If that, if that makes sense. Dean. Yeah. Um, you, my question, you, you just use a word that was the basis for my question, which is the word why. And I'm wondering with this, this usage of the word understanding, how far that goes into why because I could see understanding to me on one level implies, well, I see how the machine works. You know, I see as a sociologist, I see how society works, but I don't necessarily know um, like why it does that or uh, why, you know, the big why. Like, and I wonder if this understanding goes that far so that it, it goes to, you understand the reasons for, for everything or else the reasons that certain things act the way they do. So I hear you, Dean. The answer to your question is sort of down here. I thought maybe, okay. But dev definitely, yeah, we're definitely, we, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there as far as what is the, what is this knowledge then all about in that way? Great. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments about just the first one or the idea of knowledge? Cool. So let's go through these. Number two is kind of a tricky one. The second one is this idea of the, um, again, they're using the, the adjective of skillful or virtuous, which again, that has significance in Buddhism, but we're gonna just kind of put it on the side for tonight. This virtuous or skillful ability to perfect pure Dharma. This one's got to be the most, so by the way, of, of course, all 10 of these, this is the most like, whoa, wow. You know, giving now seems so simple com compared to this. So I want you to know that we are in, in deep in the trenches in that regard. And not only we're in the 10th Paramita where we're deep in the trenches, this so, so even linguistically, I, sh I should tell you this, actually, even linguistically, as I'm reading these in, in the original Chinese here, you get to this one and it's like, whoa, like the, the sentence structures are very complicated, which kind of signifies that they're trying to do a few things at one time. The... Um, there seems to be a tremendous amount of code language going on where words. So in this, for example, it's this idea of this, this pure Dharma, stainless. And it's like, what is that? What does that refer to? And it's a kind of a, um, what would you call it? It's a vernacular, I guess, or it's a term within Buddhism. So for example, 
the uh, the Lotus Sutra is actually this white lotus or this pure lotus school. And that that pure white lotus flower sutra, the lotus sutra, has a little bit to do with this. But again, I'm going to I'm actually going to bow out of this one because there are so many interesting Wow, I mean, from Jung, from Carl Jung to Rudolf Steiner to all of these spiritual traditions, that when you get to the upper upper levels of spiritual initiation, there is a, across cultures. By the way, in the European tradition, this Buddhist tradition, of course, there is this revelation of either a white chrysanthemum or some sort of white pure flower mandala thing that gets revealed. It kind of seems like maybe that's what's being referenced here, but I'm gonna actually, again, I'm gonna bow out at this one. It, now, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not gonna bow out. I'm gonna give you so much more, but the idea is, is that if you really, um, You know, I told you this at some point that this list of 10 is corresponding to a bunch of lists of 10 that even correspond to the 10 paramitas themselves. And so if you notice that the second paramita is moral discipline about purity, right? Stainlessness. Well, then this second dharma in the list kind of corresponds to moral discipline. And so in general, you could also read this as this sort of virtuous or skillful ability to fulfill or complete moral discipline and be totally stainless, pure in your moral activity in that way. That's what this one's about. And maybe some revelation of the, the white lotus flower, maybe. <laughs> Questions or comments about that idea? I hope nobody gets hung up on this language of purity and things because the Buddhists are pretty far past this as far as like if anybody is going to po point the dualistic finger at this and be like pure and impure that sounds pretty dualistic don't worry we know and the buddhists are saying that impurity is dualism and, and purity is to be beyond dualisms so okay let's keep going um uh number three and number four, I'm going to wrap these together because they don't both deal with the same metaphor. So number three is that the Bodhisattva practicing knowledge considers foremost the accumulation of immeasurable Bodhisattva supplies. It's this really funny term. It's a little Chinese term that means supplies. Like if you're going to go on a journey and you needed your supplies, there's this sort of like, um, I guess it's a metaphor and it's about these bodhisattva supplies. And it has a lot to do with, um, well, it has a lot to do with a lot of things. Um, by the way, the next one, just to tie these together, number four is the bodhisattva considers foremost achieving vast supplies of fortune and wisdom or fortune and pranya. So let's put those together. So the first one is just this idea of bodhisattva supplies. And that's kind of like an interesting idea. I'm, it's sort of a side project of mine to dig deeper into these supplies and sutras that speak about bodhisattva supplies. But if, 
if you do go looking at where these supplies pop up, it does seem to be speaking about a certain type of um, support, a support for one's endeavors. And so the first one are these bodhisattva supplies that can seemingly kind of take a lot of different forms. They would just be the support. And then the second one are these supplies of fortune and wisdom. Fortune's a little uh, tricky. What they're probably referring to is merit, punya, because those are usually the, um, the traditional juxtaposition for bodhisattvas is merit and wisdom. These, you know, in many ways, these have, um, without confusing the conversation, I would like to say that these have a lot to do with karma in the sense of that kind of accumulation of momentum that one gets going right? That's kind of an idea of karma that with all the things you do and all the things you say and all the things you think, you kind of get a nice amount of momentum going, you know? And I, I, I've said this at some point, but even like speaking, it's like once you start a sentence, there's a certain karmic momentum to speaking that you sort of finish saying what you... It, 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 that's a way of looking at karma, that it's this sort of momentum of action that once the ball is rolling, things start to happen. My, my hands start gesticulating, my mouth keeps speaking, my mind keeps turning with ideas. So if you're thinking of karma that way, so what I'm trying to do is skillfully speak of karma without a self, without an agent, without a, uh, an ego or an Atman in that sense. That there, in Buddhism, there can still be this sort of karmic momentum without a fixed self or fixed being being there. So now there's this karmic momentum going. And I have my karmic momentum of all the things I've done in my life and that some of that momentum manifests right away. Some things it's like, um, you know, it's like, um, um, it's like a, a Christmas present somebody sent you five years ago and it just arrived. That, that, that karma, the present was meant for you. <laughs> it just got lost in the mail, but it was still meant for you. And so it showed up. So this is all sort of a, you know, again, a Buddhist way of thinking about karma and in particular karmic um, reciprocity or whatever, that karmic uh, repercussions. But again, without any agent, without any self, there can just be the momentum there. What I'm getting at is that our lives on the daily, <laughs> Our lives on the daily are the results of all of our past actions and karma. The, you know, the reason why you keep waking up in the house you keep waking up on, up in is because you haven't made the action choices and decisions to move yet. <laughs> so guess what? You've, you've laid, you made your bed in the house you live in and now you're going to lie in it. And that's kind of an idea of karma. So car this is what's going on. And so these... Bodhisattva supplies, they seem to be about this sort of, um, through cultivation and through practice, you're, you're building up, I dare call it positive or good karma, but you're building up other types of karmic momentum. And so at a certain point, this sort of idea of the bodhisattva in accumulating bodhisattva supplies or accumulating supplies of merit and, and wisdom, I see those supplies as being like karmic results from past action coming, coming back or not coming back, but manifesting in support of your endeavors. 
that's sort of this idea. Questions about bodhisattva supplies or supplies of merit and wisdom? I didn't mention it in number two. It's a little bit in number three. There's a, a certain language that's taking place in most of these. It's the language of um, completion. It's the language of, of being like, um, for example, number two, this pure Dharma, the language is actually about um, perfecting pure Dharma. So you're, it's like you're no longer working on it, you're, you've perfected it. And this is all speaking about this transition from Bodhisattva to Buddha, this, the, you know, the fulfillment of all of this. I say that because number five, the Bodhisattva considers foremost the perfection of great compassion, the completion of great compassion. Right. So great compassion has popped up in a lot of these paramitas, but it's always been worded a slightly different way. The, the attitude or the approach to great compassion has always been worded a slightly different way. It might be about instilling great compassion in beings, or it might be about developing great compassion. And this one is about this idea of completing or perfecting great compassion. If at any point, by the way, you're wondering, well, what would that look like or be like? Think of the Buddha, <laughs> because that's what, again, is being referenced here is that the Buddha has perfected great compassion. The Buddha has perfected all pure dharmas. The Buddha has completely understood all dharmas. So just think of the Buddha. And I say that to remind you that we're at the, the, the kind of the climax of this. This is about like the, the whatever this is about. <laughs> Enlightenment, release, liberation, nirvana, whatever it's about, Buddhahood is the sort of the, the summum bonum, right? The completion of all of that. And so again, this is, these 10 are kind of referring to the, the behavior or the disposition or the ability of, of the Buddha in that way. So number six was particularly Number six and number seven actually are particularly the ones I had in mind when Dean asked his question about the why. And understanding like how versus why, right? If, if I understood Dean's question, that was sort of the kind of a part of it, right? So th this number six, for example, the Bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of knowledge entering or penetrating all types of different realms. Now, a realm, you know, a realm is going to be a datu in Sanskrit, and there are many a datu, many datus in Buddhist thinking. And the Bodhisattva wants to enter them all, is the idea. And so, I'm going to use this one to sort of address Dean's question more specifically, because even though realms can seem a little weird, it's not that weird. Um, basically, yeah, within the context of this Dharma talk tonight, if you can recall a few 20 minutes ago or whatever, I was talking about how we in the Dharma doors talk a lot about the removal of the idea of objective reality and a sort of more phenomenological, if we were to use Western language, a more phenomenological recognition that each sentient being is having their own unique perceptive experience. 
and that there isn't actually a, what I would call a God's eye view of the world by which to judge people's perceptions. It's just people's different perceptions and there actually isn't anything that they're having different perceptions of. It's just different perceptions. So if, you're under, if you understand that idea, no objective reality, uh, intersubjective uh, perception experiences, you could think of those subjective perception experiences as dot twos, as realms. And we are each sort of in our own dot two, our own realm that is dependent upon our unique conditioning uh, or sensory organs, sensations, perceptive choices, and then the consciousness. So that idea that we are each in our own dot two. And so the Bodhisattva at this stage of knowledge enters all types of different realms. And we spoke one night about the idea of entering. And this is that, um, by the way, I don't know, I can't even move. Uh, these, the next number six, seven, eight, and nine are all this entering, penetrating. And one night when we were talking, I mentioned that the Chinese use this word. It's just a simple character. Uh, it's just two lines like that. Let me see it's in here somewhere. They use this word enter in a unique, in an interesting way, one of which is the idea of entering a mountain, but entering a mountain doesn't mean go into it. It means to enter its environment, to enter the surroundings, to sort of be engulfed by it in that way. So it's a beautiful, like, it's just a way of using language that we don't use it that way. And the Chinese do, and it's sort of a beautiful aspect of Chinese language. So this entering all different types of realms, it, and it's about this idea of sort of entering or penetrating different people's worlds, getting to know all different people's worlds getting to know all kinds of realms and worlds in that way. And in particular, I would, I would suggest that you think about this from that point of view of no objective reality. And so that basically just having a conversation with somebody, if you see it the right way, is entering that realm, you know, but you, but you cannot, you know, well, how can I say this? We're not all bodhisattvas. So we all don't actually need to enter that realm. We can be like this. We can be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and, and kind of be more standoffish and objectifying of the other. And, you know, it can be, it cannot be so bodhisattva <laughs> entering in that way. But the idea is, is that especially after we've come this far through all these paramitas, there's this way in which the bodhisattva then, you know, with this understanding of intersubjectivity that we've been talking about, they enter all realms. Um, let me... Let me do seven and then I'll tie this together with the why. Dean's wanting to know of the why. So number seven is, is about actually entering all the afflicted conditionings of all sentient beings. So there we're not just entering all realms, we're actually entering the afflicted mental conditions of all sentient beings. You should know, by the way, that we are slowly creeping our way towards what is known as omniscience, all knowledge. <laughs> and so when this number, number seven says that the bodhisattva enters all afflicted mentalities, it's this idea of knowing the minds of all sentient beings, of having an awareness of the minds of all sentient beings. 
And so those two together, knowing the realms of all sentient beings and knowing the minds of all sentient beings. Here's where we get to what Dean had asked about and, and this idea of the why. So what this is about, both the realms, number six, the realms, and number seven, afflicted mental conditioning, the thing about what's going on with this type of knowledge is it's like, so the example that I've used in the past, um, it's a great example of number seven, afflicted mental conditions. So the example that I've used in the past, in order to conceive of what's being spoken about here, is I, the example I've used is imagine a, you know, I don't have one here, but imagine a nice blank sheet of paper, clean white sheet of paper. And you can imagine that sheet of white paper and I take a pin and poke a little hole in it. And what that little hole represents is a afflicted mental condition or a conditioned thought pattern or thought habit. And let's say that as I develop as a being, either from birth or over multiple lifetimes, that once white clean sheet of paper, every time I have an idea or a thought or have a little traumatic experience or conditioned thought pattern, it's a whole of, you know, different sizes, but more or less these little pinpricks. Now, the example that I, I, I want you to think about is that if I took that white sheet of paper and blasted a light through it, that all the light that passed through all the little holes would cast a shadow on the wall, right? The what you can imagine, the analogy here is that the world that we see before us is like those little holes in that paper, which is that every condition thought pattern I have and every trauma and even actually every little mental karma has created this uh, formation in my mind. And then you can imagine the light, the light of consciousness blasting through my mind and projecting a world out for me to see. The thing about that is that there is this interesting way of how can, it's a it's a really beautiful idea, but it's this way of seeing that so let's just go back to the sheet of paper for a moment it's about seeing how the shadow that is cast on the wall it is a perfect totally perfect representation of the holes in the paper well this is a perfect representation of your mental conditioning it's exactly right it's exactly according to how your mind is conditioned. And if you conditioned it a little differently, it would start to appear differently. And that, Dean, is the why. Why am I seeing this? Well, if you understand that this is a, that the, that the, that this is like a Plato's cave situation, and these are the shadows on the wall, and, but unlike Plato's cave, where the shadows are actually not of my own mental um, creation, this is saying all of this phenomena you see before you is a weird inside out reflection of your own mental state. And uh, I mean, there's so many ways in which a lot of things of this talk tonight are about to click together potentially, but it's about this idea of 
removing the objective reality of which your sense impressions may or may not correspond and recognize, oh no, this corresponds perfectly to my mind. And what that means is, is that you can sort of like really deeply understand your own mind just by looking around. Now, if there was an objective reality, then by just looking around, I would come to a better understanding of objective reality. And I could go talk to other people about objective reality. But this is saying, no, 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 this is not objective reality. This is your mind. And so you can observe all your mental conditionings. And so again, Dean, the why is right in there. Why am I seeing this? Now, the like the why, 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 that's for each of us to come to uh, total knowledge, complete understanding about. But it's, it's kind of there to be had, if you know what I mean. And what I mean by that last statement, it's there to be had, it's not a piece of objective knowledge you need to go to school to learn. It's your own, like, <laughs> experience. Thank you, Michael. If if I might just uh, interject, um, yeah, I I mean I that I I love the the holes in the paper idea, and that would tell me why I see things in my particular, you know, my way, my own the, the way no one else see thing sees things. Yes, it doesn't really quite um get to another why that i was referring to but I'll, i think i'll hold that for later uh because it i guess it's like say let's if i refer back to the bird the bird in the sky okay i see that bird in a way that like nobody else sees that bird and I look at the bird and I see it. And then I think, okay, I remember Michael Owens talking about why I see that bird in the way I do. I get it. But my, my other why, I'll call it is, but uh, why, why the bird? You know, it's like, why is that bird? Why does that bird there? Why, why does it exist? So it's, it's kind of a, a little more of a, like, it, it's a different why. But thank you. I just wanted to <laughs> throw that out there. Thanks, Dean. Any other questions, comments, or ideas? Yeah, I know. Um, some of what you were just talking about if I understand it correctly, is related to Bala when we hmm. were talking about oh. the power to read other people's minds and in a sort of a simplistic way, my understanding of that was that the Bodhisattva knows their own mind so well and they know that this, this is sort of a vague way of saying it, but that other people's minds are like their own mind, therefore they know what other people's minds are like. But what you're saying now makes me think that it's more about, they have no idea what other people's minds are like, but they know that other people's minds have little, are made of a pattern of little holes in the paper. So it's, it's sort of more about knowing the, the, the why that you were talking about. <laughs> um so because this is so interesting and because number eight number nine number ten they're fine they're fine they're right there i'm gonna i'm gonna attempt to make this even more interesting i'm gonna try to add another layer to this this may go horribly wrong I don't think so, but it's a very 
if I can get this idea across, it is totally worth it. So first of all, Noam, just to, you're totally right. The reference to power, the, the forest of conditionings of the minds of individuals that we talk through exactly 100%, this corresponds to that, absolutely. The one sort of uh, difference is that in number seven or eight, yeah, pow the Bala one, it was sort of a general idea. And this is about all realms, all minds. It's that sarvanyana, all knowledge aspect. But I'm gonna, I wanna try to do the interesting th thing. So this is, okay, so, if you're with me, and I've done it now several times this night, so you, I know you're with me. If you're kind of cool with this idea of no objective reality, <laughs> if you're cool with that, one of the, oh, wow. Okay, so one of the things that happens with that is, and I've mentioned this in Dharmador's past, that there is a way of, well, there's a way in which each of you now have your own little Michael in your mind that is dependent upon your sensory organs, your perception, your conditioning, and and that's your Michael that you're having some sort of intimate uh, class with. I don't. I actually don't have anything to do with that. I'm over here with my own sense of Michael, and then that of course gets really weird to be Michael, but with the sense of Michael. But remember, 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 we got rid of objective reality. We got rid of objective Michael that we are all you and you and you and me that we're all talking about, there is not the one objective Michael. There's the various sense impressions in each of your minds and then even the one in so-called Michael's mind, right? But that's where Michael is a Dharma practitioner trying to realize no self. So that, you know, that's just what that is. But if everybody's with me on that idea, in, in particular, no objective Michael, bye then what's really weird and interesting about that is that there is a weird, strange way then in which I am in your mind. Please forgive me, <laughs> but this is not a visual auditory experience coming at you. It's an experience that is part of you. So that's weird. But then you could also kind of begin to imagine that I have penetrated your mind in some way. What if, and this is where it goes, what if? This is where it's like, but what if there was a way then to then be a bodhisattva and to then like, this is honestly something I think about a lot, which is then, well, what if you could then time is it okay <laughs> what i okay let me let me put it to you this way let me put it to you and i put it to you, a few of you this way already so you so imagine that right that each of you have your own michael in your mind right there's a way in which when we are not buddhists in that sense and we, or we are deluded or ignorant in that sense, when we believe in an objective reality. When we believe in an objective reality, one of the things that we spend a lot, maybe for some of us a lot of time, but one of the things that we spend time doing is then sort of trying to make sure that the impression in each of your minds is the same. So you all think of me as, as the Buddhist teacher, right? So if that one person comes along and says, hey, you're Michael the clown, I'm gonna be like, I'm not a clown. I'm a serious Dharma teacher. You better get your impression of me right. 
right? So you've got the wrong impression. Let's get it straight. So there's an interesting thing that happens, which is that we spend some time, some of us more than others, in trying to make sure that we have the same sense impression in each person's mind. But what if A, we weren't interested in that, and B, we were crazy bodhisattvas interested in enlightening all beings. And so it wasn't about making sure I had the same impression in mind, but actually was okay appearing different to different people. And I actually knew their minds in that bodhisattva way well enough to know, oh, they'll think I'm old and wise because I have a gray beard or whatever. But then that person's going to think I'm young and spry because I'm doing this. And then, and what about a wild bodhisattva that actually was entering the minds of different people and having entirely different intersubjective experiences in that way. It's food for thought. This has also a lot to do with clinging to the identification of the personhood, right? We, I want to look in, yeah. Exactly. So. And that's, that's actually Connie, I'm so <laughs> glad you said that because it's, it, right. What's that? We get we get confused when um, when we don't get uh, when our our identity don't get confirmed. What we think ourselves like, you know, what yeah. like you think that I'm that? No, I'm that. <laughs> you know, so I think the mind is trying to organize the world in the sense all the time to confirm our um, identity, right? So it's uh, yeah. You and you nailed it, Connie. You nailed it, which is like yeah, when you're when you're invested in that self identity. That's a big part of it. But then you nailed it as usual, Connie, which is like, whoa, but what if we were doing this Buddhist thing of not being attached to the self and we were not as invested in making sure each person saw us the same way? And then I flipped it in that Upaya Bodhisattva way where you actually get skillfully creative with the impressions that you're leaving or making. And by the way, you know, this is like, um, um, of course, like method acting and a lot of method actors are drawing on this, this ability to, uh, e um, they even describe it, Mo uh, method actors describe it as evacuating themselves of themselves in that way. And so the same mechanism is kind of at work, but you know, that's acting versus this kind of uh, uh, cultivation, but. Okay. Cool, that did not go as far off the rails as I thought. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> um, I, I hope you can see where that was potentially rather tricky territory. <laughs> okay, um, so number eight, the language of number eight is very interesting. We are still going to be entering or penetrating. Um, we are gonna be entering or penetrating all uh, a realm, actually all realms. And this is actually, so what's interesting about the language of number eight is that it's not about entering all uh, Buddha realms or realms of the Tathagatas. Um, that's actually part of what it says. But number six and number seven, entering all realms, Entering all afflicted minds, great. Number eight though, it actually has this really kind of weird beginning, which is it's about actually, I mean, making uh, zuo, the Chinese zuo means to create or make. So you make a mind that is able to enter the realms of all Tathagatas. That's kind of a wild idea because it kind of is indicating that you don't get there through your normal mind by any means that you kind of need to like kind of do something else. And by the way, we're, we're almost at the end here. So this is like getting towards, you know, the lights coming out of the Buddha's forehead. I don't know what's going on. This is all like above my pay grade way, way above my pay grade right here, right? So I'm just giving you the juicy details, which in order to do number eight, you somehow need to make a new mind 
in order to enter the realms of all the Tathagatas. Number nine, the Bodhisattva practicing Jnana considers foremost this directing, and by the way, it's actually directing that same mind. So the mind that you created, it, it's number nine says, okay, so now you take that mind, <laughs> directing that mind to enter the extraordinary realm of the 10 powers, the fearlessnesses, and the unique qualities of all the Buddhas. Yeah. So Buddhas, fully enlightened beings, are known for having these powers, and in particular, these fearlessnesses. There's sort of four aspects to fearlessness, but I really think it's better to just embrace this idea of fearlessness. Again, there's four aspects to that, but just the fearlessness. And so this number nine, you know, again, we are, you know, fearlessness is that Abhaya Mudra. This is the Abhaya Mudra, the fearlessness Mudra. This is the Mudra that the Buddha gives to Maya or Mara, sorry, the devil. Um, and, you know, the Mara, the devil is sitting there trying to torment, scare and freak out the Buddha to get him out of his meditative state. And he gives him the Ubaya, the fearlessness mudra. This is sort of referencing that moment in the stage of enlightenment. And I guess the only thing that I really have to say about this fearlessness is I really hope that like, basically, I really hope that this whole evening's conversation about this removal of an objective reality and the embracing of a deep subjective experience that is uniquely your own, I hope that you can see where and how even that leads to fearlessness. If it's not clear, let me give you an example. The great example, the perfect example, is always going to be the dream, a dream state. And I want you to think about a dream, imagine a dream in which there's something scary and you're afraid of it. Do you actually have any reason to be afraid of it? It's a dream. You're gonna wake up in a second. It's not, even, it's not even a real thing. But there's a way in which your fear is real. You're really afraid, that's real. The circumstances under which you are afraid have a lot to do with confusion and a bunch of other stuff in the dream. Well, if everything that we just talked about regarding no objective reality, totally subjective experience, this is a product of your own kind of uh, conditioning in that way, most of the things, if not all of them, most of the things we're afraid of are like that dream where if you knew better, you wouldn't be as afraid. And then there is this Um, I don't know what you call it, you know, but then there's this state of being that is fearless. And it is what Buddhism is sort of, um, I don't want to say promising in that way, but it is what this tradition and what this practice is all about. We move from a state of anxiety and fear to liberation and fearlessness. That's what they're, they're talking about, that there is a way. That's the indicative mode. There is a way to do that. It perhaps should be realized, <laughs> right? Okay, number 10. Number 10 affords me the opportunity to say a bunch of stuff that I don't have time for. 
So number 10, the number 10 Dharma that the Bodhisattva considers as foremost in this practice of knowledge is receiving anointment and achieving the characteristics of an all-knowing Supreme One. <laughs> um, the language of the original text, the, the standard one here is ascending to the throne of an anointed one and achieving the supreme qualities of an all-knowing one. So the, this metaphor, and I don't, e I don't even know, I don't know what it is, a metaphor, but the metaphor of anointment is a wild metaphor. It's very, very popular in Christianity. It's very popular in Judaism, which is where Christianity gets it from. There's, it's very popular. Like, um, I mean, there's something about that. Now, of course, in the in the Jewish tradition, of course, the Messiah's David in particular is anointed with oil as a sign of his divine, uh, whatever Messiahhood in that way. That's sort of one aspect of this anointing tradition that then the, the Christians pick up on, and then Jesus is anointed, which makes him the king. So one of the things that I want to say, and I probably got to start wrapping this up, but these 10 paramitas and the sutra that we're reading, it's part of this larger um, uh, it's part of a larger Buddhist tradition that centers around this uh, gigantic flower ornament sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra. So this is a, and this is only one, one of three volumes, by the way, it's a huge sutra. That is like the mother of this tradition. And this sutra we're reading is like a little, uh, like spin-off series of that one, but they're all in the same family. And in in if if any of my students are are in, are listening or if you listen in the future, you know, this is the type of Buddhism that I call royal Buddhism or imperial Buddhism because it uses a lot of royal metaphors, imperial metaphors of monarchs and kings and queens and crowns and you might be thinking like really <laughs> in buddhism but i would suggest you know if you if you're into buddhism go look at the tibetan tradition sometime and you'll start to notice that they wear a lot of crowns they do a lot of anointing they actually do a lot of monarchical royal type of stuff and it's way too late for me to speak on that metaphor, but again, I want you to, if you don't know, it's a metaphor that's, again, it's in Judaism, it's in Christianity, it's in a lot of traditions, this sort of, this, um, um, to speak of spiritual cultivation culminating in a, um, in a chrism, uh, the chrism is where we get the word charismatic from, but in this kind of anointing, it's a thing. I'm not claiming I know what it's entirely about. There's a lot of esoteric, uh, esoteric traditions, both Eastern and Western, that speak about this anointment. There's traditions that think that say it's an actual biological process of cultivation, where like tiny drops of dimethyltryptamine or something drip out into your cerebrum and you trip out or something, and that's the anointment. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that there is a whole world of discourse about the anointment and what it means to be anointed and all of this. Um, so I leave it at that, that it is about this sort of, um, the last stage here is about full Buddhahood, full enlightenment, full enlightenment. And though, yeah. If you want, you want to know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. I'll just tell you what it is. Cause you know, why not? 
the way that I understand it is, again, in the context of this Dharma talk, if you were following me and you, we successfully removed objective reality, and of course, in the objective world, there could be only one king of the world, right? There could only be one because there's only one world and there's all the humans fighting to be king of this world. But if we get rid of objective reality, one world, and we are all in our own subjective worlds, then there is a way in which you can be empowered and become sovereignly, can become sovereign over your own world. King of your world, God of your own world. But I don't want to get too Mormon about it or whatever, you know, where you're like a God of your own universe. It's not about that. It's about a sort of fearlessness and sovereignty over your being and over your your life in that way. Not And if you are, are not clear about sovereignty, we're talking about not being subject to anything. So that's a kind of, a, that would be a nice place to be in, not to be subject to anything. And in the Buddhist tradition, they sometimes describe that as being like the king or queen, but the monarch of your Buddha land. So, so that's it. We did another 10. <laughs>